So are you willing to follow the truth no matter where it leads? studying the book of Jeremiah while I was on vacation. And the question I asked you was, does your God have a reverse? The word reverse means to turn upside down, to turn back, to make void, to annul, to go in the opposite direction. Jeremiah 7.23. Now, everybody has a car. And all cars have reverse. And thank goodness for reverse. But you just can't sit there and hope you have reverse. You have to do something to put it in reverse. You can't say, back up, car. You've got a little reverse deal there. It's R, or drive, or neutral, or low. Or uh, whatever. Jeremiah 7.23. I want you to know, you're going to find out that God will reverse himself. But I want to show you, you've got to do something before he reverses himself. This thing I did command them, God says. Listen and obey my voice. And I will be your God. You will be my people. And you have to walk in the whole way that I command you, that it may be well with you. You see, we all want well. We all want to be blessed. The word well here means cheerful, beautiful, pleasant, and lovely. Hey, you're looking well. You're looking well. God says that's fine, but you have to obey my voice, and you will be walking the whole way that I command you. Then it will be well with you. So before I can go in reverse, I have to take it out of park and pass neutral and put it in reverse. Before I can become well, I have to obey God's word and do what he tells me to do. Verse 24, but they would not listen to, and they would not obey me, and they would not bend their ear to me, but follow the counsels and the stubborn promptings of their own evil hearts and minds, their souls. They didn't listen to their spirit. They listened to their mind, their will, and their emotion. It looks good, do it. It feels good, do it. And they turned their backs on me and went in reverse instead of forward. Every day in your Christian life, you get to choose. You go forward or you go reverse spiritually. Your choice. And you just don't wake up, and it's not a lottery pick. You choose. Every morning when you wake up, are you going to go forward with God or are you going to go backwards with God? And you've got to choose that, and we do choose that, and we walk in what we choose to walk in. We can't blame it on our wives, blame it on our husband, blame it on the pastor and core pastor and the elders and the deacons and the staff. You can't blame it on the weather. You can't blame it on the politicians. You can't blame it on television. You can't blame it on the movie industry. You choose. When I take my car and put it in drive, I don't check with anybody else. I don't call a 911 number and say, is it all right if I put my car in drive? No, I choose. I choose if I want to park and put it in reverse. I choose if I want to speed. I choose if I want to coast. I choose if I don't want to ride at all. We went up at 10,800 feet 
and Tahoe. And I didn't have to do anything except put it in neutral and just let it coast down the mountain. But if I did, it was going too fast. And it's pretty, pretty weird on those streets. So you just be very careful, drive real slow, put it in low. I had a four-wheel drive, which helped. And then you just go real slow. Why? I chose to do that. Why? Because Bebby would have killed me if I didn't. Mike Watts knows what I'm talking about. He drove in Costa Rica with a car full of ladies one time, and his eardrums have never healed since then. <laughs> Verse 24. They would not listen to, and they would not obey me. There's the problem. Every problem you and I have in life, it's not because of the economy or how much oil selling for or how high gas is. Every problem we have is because we have not obeyed God. Okay? Now, Jeremiah 26, 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jericho, son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word from the Lord. Verse 2. Here's the word from the Lord that he gives Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, Jeremiah. Now, please get this. This is God's church. These are Christian people who have come to worship in God's house, kind of like you did this morning. And speak to all the people of the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house. And Jeremiah, speak all the words that I command you to speak to them and subtract not a word. Don't you dare miss one word. You tell them exactly what I said, no matter if they throw stuff at you, get mad at you, I want to kill you. You tell them exactly what I said. Now, verse 3. It may be, Jeremiah, they might even listen. I feel like that every Sunday. <laughs> well, Greg, nice offertory. I'm going up there, and I got a message God has given me. And they, you know, who knows? They might listen. That's really exciting. Here we go. And turn every man from his evil way. That I, now watch it. What did they do? They have to turn from their evil way. You have to repent. You have to confess. You have to admit, God, I'm wrong. And then what happens? God says, well, then you know what? I might relent. Now, I, I, I did a real good thing this week. I printed out all the definitions for you. You should have got a page with all the definitions. So when I say the word that you don't know what it is, you can read it, all right? Relent means to back off, become less harsh, cruel, to soften, tempered, to become more mild. All right? You may relent and reverse. That's the first time I had seen the word reverse in the Bible. 6.30 in the morning in Lake Tahoe. I got all excited. I said, wow. And I started looking up concordance, and you can't find very many words reversed in the Bible, but I found some. All right? I will reverse my decision. Now, please get what I'm saying. Listen, God has already made a decision of what he was going to do to you. But because you repented, God says, whoa, time out. I may relent and reverse the decision I've already made against you. You got to get this. You've got to know our God. We have a loving God. I don't want, you know, you've done this when as a parent, you know, all of you, you know, son, I'm going to have to spank you. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Well, that's not true, but that's what we say because we hate that we have to do it. Well, God says right here, I don't really want to do this. And because you have relented and started to repent, I now will reverse my decision concerning the evil which I purpose to do to them because of their evil doings. We have a fair God who's an honest God. It may be that they will listen and turn every man from the evil. I may repent, endorse my decision. Verse 6b, I will make this city subject to the curses of all nations of the earth. So vile in their sight will I be. These people that Jeremiah prophesying to are going to they tell them, we're going to kill you. You can't come down here and talk to us like that, tell us that God said this thing. We're killing you. 
What would happen to a city when all the nations come against it? They'd be destroyed overnight. So vile in their sight will I be. This is God. Do you really know God? He's sovereign. Verse 2, excuse me, verse 12. Then Jeremiah said to all the, listen to who he's talking to, all the princes, all the higher-ups, all the people, hey, guys, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house. Sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city. The words that you have heard, I'm sorry, but let me tell you what he's going to do to this church. Let me tell you what he's going to do to this tri-city area. This is what God told me to tell you. Man, I'd be out of here within 20 minutes. The locks would be changed. I'm sorry. This is God. This is God. I can't explain to you why we have tornadoes and it wipes out whole towns. I told the 830 service, I remember about five, six years ago, a lady came to me before the Sunday service with her little boy, precious little guy. Pastor Trey, you're going to have to explain to him. He can't understand why God is love, why he would let a hurricane come and hit Galveston and destroy homes and kill people and everything else. And I said, you know why, son? Because God is a cleansing God. And God has created hurricanes to come and to cleanse the beaches and the water and everything else that's been all messed up by humans. And he cleanses with the hurricane. You see, these people didn't say, God, I just won the lotto and I want to build me a $6 million house on the beach in Galveston, okay? No, they go to the real estate guy. You got a nice $6 million house I can buy on the beach? Oh, yeah, I got a whole bunch of them. Here you go. Write your check. Here we go, man. We got it made now. And all of a sudden, there's a hurricane hidden for Galveston, Texas, and it's a, it's, 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 it's a number five. And it's going to blow the... Oh, what are you doing, God? Excuse me? Did God tell you to build that house on his beach and pay $6 million so he could blow it away? I mean, we need to get real. God is sovereign, but he's a cleansing God. Now watch. Therefore, verse 13, amend your ways, amend your doings, obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then and only then will he relent and reverse the decision, not the thoughts, the decision he's already made concerning the evil which he has pronounced against you. He's already thought up what to do. He's already confessed what he's going to do. But now because you are repenting, whoop, I'm going to relent and I'm going to reverse the things that I've already decided, I've already decided to do because of you. Verse 19. Did Hezekiah king of Judah and all Judah put Micah to death? Did he not reverent, reverent, reverently fear the Lord and entreat the Lord? Are we at that place where we fear the Lord? The word fear the Lord doesn't mean, oh, God, don't hit me again. It means you love him so much. You're in such awe of his wonderful love and kindness and grace and mercy that you just honor him. You respect who he is because that's fearing the Lord. That's, that's fearing the Lord. And look what he says. And then fear the Lord and then treat the Lord. Ask him, call on him, pray to him. And did not the Lord relent and reverse the decision concerning the evil? But here we are thinking of committing what will be a great evil against ourselves. In other words, while Jeremiah's prophesying, the leaders are saying, hey, we need to kill this dude. He's telling us word for word what God said to tell us and what he's going to do to us if we don't listen to him. And we're planning to kill him, fixing to kill the prophet. That's what he means right here. It, it will be a great evil against themselves. 2 Samuel 24, 16. Now watch this one, because this is interesting. He, in, he identifies an angel. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, to destroy it, it wasn't the Palestinians. It wasn't Hitler. It was an angel of the Lord. He relented of the evil and reversed his judgment and said to the, watch how he names him, the destroying angel. 
He's got an angel that can destroy an individual or an entire city. He tells the destroying angel, it's enough. That's it. That's enough now. Back off. Okay? Stop. Stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. Do you know God has angels that can destroy a whole country? He can destroy the whole city. He can destroy the whole state of Texas in, in one breath. And, and say, oh, my gosh, we had a terrible tragedy in Texas. Yeah, God spoke. The word destroying angel. Let me give you the definition. You might be able to relate it to some things. It means to decay, devastate, to ruin by pulling down, by wounding, to kill, individually or an entire community. A destroying angel can destroy the tri-city area just as quick as he can destroy one person. It means to harm, to injure, to violate, to act wickedly. You better know your God. You better know your God. He, he's in charge of these angels. Nehemiah 9, 17b. Always remind yourself you are God ready to pardon you're gracious, you're merciful, you're slow to anger, you have great steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. You see, God has destroying angels, but God's a merciful God, a loving God, a just God. You have to know that. Jonah 3.1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, go to Nineveh. Nineveh would be like... Uh, a really bad state. But it says here, he went to Jonah the second time. Do y'all remember the first time? First time he came to Jonah, this evangelist, this great evangelist, and he said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and lead that entire town to Jesus. And Nineveh, you got to be kidding. Those stinking people, they're sinners. They watch cable TV. They watch R-rated movies. I mean, you don't want, I, there's no way. I'm not wasting my time telling them about God. They're not going to ever get saved. Well, welcome to a whale, Jonah. That's where he wound up. And then when he came out of the whale, a little bleached more than he was when he went in, verse 8 comes up. And God says, let's see. I went the second time to Jonah. Now verse 8. Let man and beast covet with sackcloth and let them cry mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell God may turn, may revoke his sentence against us when we have met his terms? Now, you've got to get this. God may turn and revoke his sentence. Now, remember, he just got through revoking his decision. Now, he's actually put out a sentence against us when we have met his terms. And then he'll turn away from his fierce anger so that we perish not. If we repent, if we repent, if I'm driving my car and Bethany says, uh-oh, there's a roadblock, you're going to have to back up. Well, I think I can turn. I think I can just go around the back up. No, I think I can make it in a circle. Back up. Well, I can't back up until I actually put it in reverse. Right. Same thing with you. You better, you better get straight with God. I will. You better quit that habit. I will. You better get rid of that addiction. I will. Well, no, no. You've got to do something to reverse the curse. All right? Here it is. Who can tell? God may turn and revoke his sentence against us when we met his terms. What are his terms? Repent. Confess. And then I will change the things I have spoken towards you. Who can tell? God may turn and revoke his sentence when we meet his terms. Now, Colossians 3.13, the New Testament. Praise God. Be gentle and forbearing with one another. You got the definition for forbearing. It means to cease from proceeding. Stop what you're doing. Pause. Be patient. 
restrain oneself from action or violence, be long-suffering, indulgent toward those who injure us. What? Be indulgent with those who injure us. Be indulgent with those who talk about us. Be indulgent with those who don't like us. That's forbearance. God says forbearance means to hold back, to put up with, to refrain from, to bear with, and then to control yourself. There's many things about everybody here. You got junk in your life, every one of us. The problem is I'm the only one that gets up here and you get to see it. One Sunday, I'm going to have every one of you come up here and speak for about five minutes, and we can all find out how many of us are nuts. Because and, and, then we'll just, we can't help ourselves, all right? Now, the Bible says, put on forbearance. Put on. Put up with me. Bear with me. Control yourselves. Every morning when I wake up, I get an option. I can put on the world, or I can put on the Spirit. I can put on the Holy Spirit of God or I can put on the world. That's your choice every day. Every day. And you can take him off and put him on whatever you want throughout the day. But you want to start the day with the Holy Spirit. First thing you do in the morning, good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. And just let him have it. What a loving God we serve. 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord does not delay. He's never late. He will always be at the seat, sitting down at 1030, waiting for the service to start. He will always be at his seat at 830, waiting for the service to start. He's never tardy. He's never late. He's never slow about what he promises. According to some people, conception of slowness. We've got some friends and they've been our friends for 21 years. Why? Because Bebby and I are just wonderful people, and we still like them as friends. <laughs> we know that if we're going to meet them at 7 o'clock, we will be there at quarter to 7, knowing that my cell phone will ring at 10 after 7, and they will explain to me how bad the traffic is, and they're going to be 20 more minutes late. And being the wonderful Christians that we are, we say, okay. And then when they walk in, I said, you know what? It's too difficult to be your friend. Because basically you don't respect us. Because in your little mind, what you're saying is, my time is more valuable than your time. Number one. Or number two, you have a spirit of rebellion that's hung over from your life that you, before you got saved. And you're saying, nobody's going to tell me what time to be anywhere. We all go through that junk in different areas of our life. My problem is I get there too early. And I don't know what that's about. You know, that they're going to they're gonna run out of food or they're not going to have seats or what. But if, if, I, if I'm going to meet you at 6, I mean, I'm serious. I go to breakfast with people I, at 7 o'clock or La Madeline opens at 6.30, 6.30. I'm in La Madeline having coffee, studying my Bible, waiting for the person who's going to be there at 7.20. And I'm sure I had not figured out yet what that weakness is, but I'm sure God will tell me sometime. Or maybe some of you might. <laughs> he is long-suffering. Now listen to how God is as I close. He is long-suffering. He's extraordinarily patient toward you. <laughs> All you got to do, guys, is look around. Every one of us in that building should be dead. If God wasn't loving and patient, and merciful, we'd all be dead. Man, he'd have killed me a long time ago, and I'd have killed you a long time ago. I mean, I'm serious. God loves us unconditionally in spite of us. Well, look what else it says. He's long-suffering, extraordinary patient toward you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. That's what I want to close with. Once we repent, we put God in motion. No matter what 
We may not know what he's already decided about us. We may not know his decision. We may not know the order he's already passed. We may not know what he's already planning to do to us. And all of a sudden, we come, oh, God, forgive me. And God said, whoop, 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 whoop. Time out, destroying angel. Time out, time out. Did you hear what Craig just said? He's repenting. You know what? Forget about my promise. Forget about the decision. Forget about that flight plan I gave you, angel. Forget about, I'm going to go ahead and relent, and I'm going to reverse my decision about Curry because he's repented. He's back in the grace of love. That's what I'm closing with. Listen. Not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. You don't have to go through most of the stuff you go through because you haven't repented. If you repent, you may get healed. If you repent, your finances will get blessed. I mean, you'd be amazed how Clarence and I, we go through this every week. People call and want us to help them financially, and they got a major problem. And we've heard every story there is known to man. But do you know what it does to us? We've got the money to help you, and yet when we check your tithing record, you haven't given one penny to this church in three years. And my Bible says you're robbing God. And you have caused God to put a curse on your finances. And you're asking Clarence and I, say, eh, who's worried about God? We'll give you some money anyhow. We'll override his curse. I did that for years when they come walking here with a couple of kids and no place to eat. It happened to us uh, somewhere yesterday, wasn't it? We was somewhere to eat and some guy was wanting a dollar. Yeah. We went to this farmer's marketplace and, and uh, the breakfast club, Steve, and uh, some guy sitting out there. And, and while I was eating, I'm sitting there looking at this guy and said, I wonder, I wonder if he can afford to eat here or whatever. And I thought about, you know, and I said, oh, well, probably he's sitting here waiting to buy some stuff. I walked out and he said, so do you have a dollar? And so I gave him $10. I said, just bless you, brother. God will bless you, okay? All we've got to do is repent. Right now, before you leave this building today, repent. Repent, 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 because look what he says. I don't want any of you to perish, all right? And that he's long-suffering, extraordinary patient, not desiring that any should perish, that it should all turn to repent, okay? All right.